that's what I do is astrobiology. Um, and part of the reason is because there hasn't been too much new from the Mars results. Uh, but partly because there's other, other cool things happening. Um, so uh, I want to start with a motivation point. This actually follows up on the last principle we just heard, attack hard problems. <laughs> to me, the hardest problem in astrobiology is, is there other type of life? Uh, we see one type of life on Earth, we, we sort of take it for granted. This is its icon, if you will. This is the so-called tree of life. This is all life on Earth mapped onto a single phylogenetic tree. I'm not sure how to put the viruses on it, but they're certainly part of the same system. One type of life on Earth. We think it started on Earth. We're not sure of that. We think it started on Earth a long, long time ago, three and a half billion years ago. We're pretty sure that's when we see the first evidence of it. But we don't know how it started. We can't reproduce it in the lab. But we know that there's only one type of life. So the hardest question in my field the most important question in my view is, can we find another type of life? So we're searching for aliens. By an alien, we mean something not on our tree of life, not related to us. So this is an interesting paradigm shift. When I was a kid, aliens were defined geographically. If you were from somewhere else, Mars, you were an alien. Right? I'm talking alien in the planetary sense, not in the INS <laughs> sense. Right? which also defines it geographically. But if you were from somewhere else, you were an alien. And if you were an alien, you were from somewhere else. But now it's defined biochemically. If you are on our tree of life, you are not alien, no matter what planet you came from. If we go to Mars and find organisms on our tree, they're not aliens. They're the same life as us, maybe spread by rocks or something, meteorites. But if you were to find a new organism in your backyard that does not map on this tree of life, you have found a second genesis and a truly alien life. So that's the tough problem we're trying to solve. Why are we solving it? Because then we'd have two types of life. So instead of a book for biochemistry class by Leninger called Biochemistry, you'd have two books, <laughs> Biochemistry 1 and Biochemistry 2, twice the fun. Uh, and it would also tell us that life is common in the universe. If right here in our solar system life started twice, independently, then that would be the first compelling evidence we have that the phenomenon we call life is not a fluke. So we're not alone in the universe at the level of life. So that's the motivation for the first two stories. Mars, I think it used to look like Earth. It's a lot smaller. It didn't maintain Earth-like conditions because it's so much smaller. Uh, no plate tectonics, less gravity, no magnetic field. So that starts now story one, which is Curiosity on Mars. It landed a, year, a little more than a year ago. It's a rover. I'm involved in two of the instruments. But the instrument that's most relevant to the search is the instrument searching for organic material. This is, to me, a picture. This is a picture of Yellowknife Bay, one of the sites. We spent a month, the rover spent a month at this site last uh, spring and early summer. And I really like this site. And I like to show this picture because it, it looks like many places you've probably seen. If you've driven anywhere between Las Vegas and Los Angeles, you've gotten out of your little car, you see that. It's, it's no power lines. Yeah. <laughs> but you can imagine it. Yeah. And you can imagine somebody walking by, you know, do I have cell reception? <laughs> <laughs> it really looks familiar. And I think this is why Mars is so, uh, calls so many people, because its landscapes look so familiar. And this is, is different than any other planet in the solar system, really. The moon has interesting landscapes, landscapes, but they don't look familiar. They look alien. And Io and Europa, they're all interesting, but they're not familiar. Whereas you look at Mars and you, something in your mind says, yeah, I've seen that. And indeed, uh, this site is, to me, the most interesting site we, we have yet explored on all the missions we sent to Mars. Uh, I'll tell you why. It's because this is inside a big crater, and we know that the crater was formed three and a half billion years ago, and then soon thereafter the crater filled with water, a big giant uh, lake, 100 kilometers, 150 kilometers across, full of water, mud settles to the bottom, that mud hardened and was buried, and the site that we were di digging is in that mudstone, and it was recently exposed 70 million years ago. So 
70 million years is recent on Mars history. So this was mud, deposit on a lake, buried and protected, and then recently the upper materials were rolled away and it was revealed and we found it and drilled into it. I can't tell you how excited I was, right? So here's that mudstone. We know it's mudstone because these are carbonate, uh, gypsum muds that solidified. This is rock. It's, hard. it's not a hard rock like a basalt, but it's solid rock. It's not porous or dirt. It's solid rock. Uh, it's a mudstone. We drilled into it, and the colors aren't very good, but this is red and this is gray. You can see it on the screen here. You can this is red and this is gray. That sounds kind of trivial, but this is the first time we've found gray Mars. Everywhere else we've landed and dug and scraped, it's red, 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 red. Here, we drilled only a few centimeters and it was gray. That really was astounding. Uh, I was very excited because if, this, if you did this on Earth in any sort of mudstone, you could be sure that that gray stuff would be rich in organic material uh, that was deposited with the mud. Uh, and the instrument we have that searches for that is called SAM, Sample Analysis on Mars. The PI is Paul Mahaffey at Goddard. And it searches for organics. And this is kind of a technical point, but the reason we haven't seen organics on previous missions has to do with what we think is in the soil, salts in the form of perchlorate. And this instrument has a chance of seeing through that. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, here's the first results from that instrument. We see a release of all sorts of gases. We see the signature of the perchlorate coming out. We see H2S, sort of this rotten egg smell. This stuff, on Earth, you'd expect it to have sort of this rotten egg smell, and it does. It has everything we think we would expect it to have in terms of its elements, its composition, this curious oxygen pulse due to perchlorate. We were expecting that from previous results. We saw organics, but they weren't Martian. There was all this contamination. We had brought with this instrument beakers full of a reagent that we were going to use in a liquid extraction experiment. And somewhere on launch and route to Mars, the beakers broke and it spilled in the instrument. So we have to pull that contamination out. All this stuff is contamination. So we're kind of in a fix, which is one reason why I'm only giving this mission a third of my talk, because we don't have an answer yet to are there organics on Mars. Uh, will we detect it? Well, it's going to be very hard because the concentration is low. It's hard to see against this contamination and the reaction with perchlorate. It's going to be a difficult detection. I don't think we're going to get a definitive detection out of it. Uh, the mission will do a lot of other things. We're planning two, there, two more missions being planned to Mars. I hope to be involved in them and get them to learn from this lesson that we're making. But I want to jump ahead, uh, and there probably will be a publication soon where we say we might have found organics, but it's not definitive. That doesn't really answer the question about life. We know organics make up life, but we know that organics are produced by non-biological processes. So for example, the Sutter's Mill meteorite that fell over Sacramento about a year and a half ago, this is a picture of it, it's rich in organics. They have nothing to do with biology. Here is organics made in a laboratory, nothing to do with biology. This is organics that make up biology. Is there a difference? If we go to Mars and find organics, can we tell whether they are this kind or this kind or that kind? Uh, the answer is yes. There are some ways in which the organics in your body are different than the organics in a meteorite. And the primary way is that the organics in biology are chosen and the organics in the meteorite are random. And an example of this is in the amino acids in the proteins in your body. Your body only uses left-handed amino acids. It doesn't use right-handed amino acids. Left, all the proteins in your body are, the linking, are formed by the linking together of left-handed amino acids in a big giant chain. Doesn't use right-handed amino acids in proteins. Life doesn't. Whereas in the meteorites, we find amino acids, but we find both right and left. So we could imagine going to Mars, finding amino acids, and finding that they're all one type, one handedness. That would tell us that there's a biological selectivity occurring, especially if we found 20 of them that were of that type. So we're searching for organics. When we find organics, we'd search for amino acids. When we find amino acids, we would search for this signature of life, its selectivity. 
life chooses chemistry doesn't. Um, and so life chooses a particular set of amino acids and then it chooses a particular chirality. It's like driving on the street. You drive on the left, it's okay as long as everybody drives on the left. Or everybody can drive on the right. Uh, you just don't want everybody driving on both sides simultaneously. Uh, so we might still find organics on Mars and we might still do this set search, but there's other worlds besides Mars that are, could tell us something about life. Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, Enceladus, the moon of Saturn, and Titan, the moon of Saturn. Enceladus in particular is the focus right now. Enceladus is a small moon, so about the size of the state of Oregon. Icy moon, it's got a jet of water coming out the South Pole. It's flux of water about equal to the flux of water from Old Faithful Geyser. It's really quite remarkable. Uh, it's being coming from a pressurized pocket of liquid water, slightly salty, jetting out through cracks in the ice. And the amazing thing is that the Cassini spacecraft, which has flown through this plume, has shown that it contains organic material. So there it is, coming out. It's not water, it's soup coming out. We already know it's there. Organics, uh, there's ammonia, there's organics, there's uh, hydrogen, there's CO2. All the requirements for life are there. You could take this soup, bottle it, and grow E. coli happily. So we are forming a team. That we will meet again on Friday at the American Geophysical Union meeting in San Francisco this week. A, U a joint U.S.-Japan team to go fly this, a plume, fly through this plume, collect some of that material, and bring it back to Earth. Uh, the model, the, the spacecraft we are pointing to as heritage are Stardust, which was a U.S. mission that brought back a piece of a comet, and Hayabusa, which was a Japanese mission that brought back a piece of an asteroid. The U.S. and Japan are the only two countries that have brought samples back to Earth from beyond the moon. Uh, and the programmatic model is a very successful international mission that was U.S. and European called Cassini. Uh, and our first team meeting was at JPL in June. Our next one is Friday at, in San Francisco at the AGU. Uh, and it's uh, really quite, uh, could be very, very exciting. We, the fundamental challenge here is bringing it back to Earth, so-called planetary protection. Uh, NASA has a planetary protection officer who's in charge of certified missions. And we are saying we're going to go fly through a plume, collect material from a subsurface ocean that we think is habitable, and we're interested in seeing if there's life in it, we're going to bring it back to Earth. So that raises concern. <laughs> <laughs> their, first, uh, their first response is, well, you have to heat sterilize it. <laughs> so you have to heat it up so hot that all the carbon bonds are broken, but then we've lost the information we're, we're interested in. So at our meeting on Friday, we're going to suggest that the Japanese take over the responsibility of building a containment system that will guarantee that it will reach Earth intact without breaking. Uh, we'll see if that works. Uh, so that's story two. But I want to make a slight change. Astrobiology is the study of the origin, evolution, and distribution of life. That's what I've been talking about. Are we alone? Is there life elsewhere? Can we go look for it? But it's also a discussion of the future of life in the universe. And this, is, uh, this was a shift in 1997. It uh, came out of NASA headquarters. Before then, we had a program that was called Exobiology. It stopped right here, period. Then uh, we had a bunch of meetings and talking and blah, 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 and then we added the future. Now, I, re I pushed hard for it. I was excited by it. I'm much more interested in the future uh, because the future involves human choice. The future is not just a passive record. The future is whatever you make of it, as Doc said in Back to the Future. Right? Uh, it implicitly involves, explicitly involves human choice. So what choices are we going to make? Uh, well, I have a suggestion, of course. Uh, we should make choices such that we enhance the richness and diversity of life in the universe. That's how That should be the basis of our choices. So what does that mean? It means, one, we should search for and support the second genesis of life. If there's other life forms out there, we should know about them, and we should help them out if they need help. Well, whether they need it or not, we should help them. We're from the government, we're here to help. <laughs> uh, or, if there's no life out there, we should expand life from Earth, if our goal is to enhance the richness, diversity of life. So, so part of my job is searching for life, but part of it is 
expanding life beyond the Earth. And so this is the story three, the moon. The surface of the moon is a unique radiation and gravitational environment. Can life survive there? Uh, so we have taken advantage of uh, the Google X Prize. Google has offered $40 million to any company that can put a rover or a lander on the moon with certain stipulations. So we've gone to them and said, would you carry a small payload for us? Us being uh, my group at Ames. Um, our payload is a little tiny greenhouse in which we will grow plants. We will just see if plants can germinate and grow. Plants will be a rabbit a little mustard seed, grow through the initial stages of growth in the few hours of a few days, a week or so of the mission. So this would be about the size of a uh, small Kleenex box. Not the long ones, the small ones. The cubes, the Kleenex cubes. It's the size of a Kleenex cube. It would hold about 150 Arabidopsis seeds, and they would be on the moon for about 15 days before it's night. Of course, the moon has a 28-day day-night, 14 days of light, 14 days of darkness. So we only go through a lunar day, then the mission's over. And the plants grow about that much in 10 days. So we easily can see their growth. Are they, they going to stay in their own protected environment or they put them out there? On the no, no, they're the inside a one atmosphere pressure, Earth normal environment, but they're on the moon with lunar gravity and radiation. So they're in a can. Right. So it's sort of the Asian gravity that you think exactly. that might, make, might make a difference. Right, okay. right, right. That's the scientific justification is to look at uh, to look at plant growth and lunar gravity and radiation, we look at germination, phototropism, and circumutation in these seedlings. So we have the, that's our science goal. But in some sense, I have a uh, philosophical goal, which I think would just be cool to have life born and grow and die in another world. And I'd rather that life be a plant than me at this <laughs> early stage. <laughs> Has this done? been done in at space stations? Oh yes, it's been done in the space station. We have done, this exact plant is grown in the space station. We know how it grows at zero G, and we know how it grows at one G. We have no idea at all how it grows at one third, one sixth G. Why would you think that it doesn't in between? Well, it grows very different at zero than it does at one. Okay. So at what point do you go from zero to okay. one? Does the transition at a half? So that everything less than half okay, is like zero, or is the transition closer to zero. If it's at a half and the moon is more like space station, we're not going to have gardens on the moon. If one sixth is more like one, then everything's fine. Right? Yeah. Uh, so that's that's our uh, plan for the moon, but we want I, I really want to take it to Mars. So we're also proposing more of a long shot to put a put a uh, plant growth mission on the next rover to Mars. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know if you know the story of Rose for Ecclesiastes, but there's a great line in it where the queen of Mars is talking to the protagonist and she says, there has never been a flower on Mars, but we will learn to grow them. And uh, I, I think that's a, a really uh, compelling story. So we would like to, uh, to see it come true. And then this is the end. Ah. <laughs>